We begin with the updates coming in from the Korean Peninsula where tension is rising in the Korean Peninsula. The combined amount of stock secured loans taken out by South Korea's Jabra families surpassed 5 trillion won. In our reality, the Korean Peninsula plays host to both one of the most militarized borders and volatile politics in the world. Over 70 years have passed since the ceasefire that paused the Korean War against the backdrop of the Cold War, with the hopes of a peaceful reunification diminishing every single year as members of torn apart families slowly fade away. The division of what is one of the oldest civilizations in the world into extreme communist and extreme capitalist halves is a historical tragedy which continues to adversely affect global stability today with seemingly no end in sight as North Korea continues to isolate while displaying brinksmanship. But what happened to these two countries in the universe of cyberpunk and what is going on in the Korean Peninsula by the year 2077? The story of United Korea starts, according to the Pacific Rim sourcebook, in the year 1994. Up until this year, events in Cyberpunk's universe have for the most part seemingly occurred the same way they have in ours, from the early Imperial Japanese annexation up to the end of the Korean War. However, the Great Stock Crash of 94 leads to a paralysis of the United States and European governments, which will play a pivotal role in the ability of the United States military to reinforce their South Korean allies. In 1995, longtime neighbor Japan kickstarts a policy called the grand unification of ministries and agencies, which end up in the increase of political influence wielded by right-wing politicians and the notorious Arasaka Corporation. In 1996, the U.S. military officially withdraws and empties their bases in both South Korea and Japan so that it can tend to domestic issues in the American mainland. Barely three years after, in 1999, at the turn of the 21st century, the Korean War resumes though many in the world ignorant of the original armistice called the Second Korean War. South Korea claims that their northern counterparts under the regime of leader Kim violated airspace sparking the war despite a suspicious lack of activity according to foreign radars at the time. Japanese corporations start profiting from the Korean War due to armament and shelter sales. As the war progresses into the year 2000, the old Cold War lines are redrawn, and of course, behind-the-scenes aid is supplied by China and the Neo-Soviet Union to North Korea, while South Korea is supplied by the United States and Japan. The war, just like before from the years 1950 to 1953, seesaw with the North and South constantly losing and gaining ground. The South Korean capital city of Seoul is lost at some point to the North Korean forces during the conflict displacing millions of people. The war comes to a frustrating stalemate as the South Korean government relocates to the southern port city of Busan. The overall situation worsens in 2002 when a worldwide wheat shortage shifts global economic power to southern China, Japan, Thailand, and Vietnam, leaving both Koreas at a potential disadvantage due to their war. Finally, in the year 2004, a South Korean general called Yi byung yun carries out a coup d'etat against the South Korean national government, citing that the civilian leadership was too incompetent and often snapped at each other as to who got the credit, who got the blame, and so forth during the conflict. In May of 2004, General Yi established a military junta overthrowing the government and led his so-called United Korean Army in a series of victories against the North Koreans. Much of the critical success in the campaign against the North Koreans was based on the general's right-hand man and brother General Yi Hyo-dong's bombing raid on Subunho Dam and the Yongbyon nuclear plant, which not only irradiated North Korean soldiers and cut off energy, but also helped eliminate Chinese supply lines in June of 2004. In November 2004, South Korean forces reoccupied the capital city of Seoul with unconfirmed reports of Arasaka Corporation soldiers helping the army. And in March 2005, South Korean forces finally took control of what was formerly North Korea, 
which pushed North Korean Supreme Leader Kim the Younger to suicide. With the North Korean regime eliminated and resistance dwindling down as occupation took place, General Yi announces the formation of the United Republic of Korea, finally reuniting the two countries through war. Democratic elections were held that year, and of course, war hero General Yi won in a landslide, but his victory would be short-lived as he was assassinated on June 4th at a press conference in the Chongwade, or the Blue House. According to freelance war correspondent Victor Perot, the assassination only worked as it was a bomb that set off wounding him and killing about 100 other journalists in addition to many others. Suspiciously, General Yi's brother, General Yi Ho-dong, was also shot down in a plane by the United Korean Air Force over the Chinese-Korean border, and his body was never recovered, at least according to the Chinese Communist Party. Why General Yi Ho-dong was flying in a F-16 fighter jet fleeing the new United Republic of Korea is still a mystery to this day, although one can make some guesses. The power vacuum left by the death of General Yi was filled by General Park, who was backed by the conservatives who had a distaste for the now dead General Yi. Stricter regulation of drugs, alcohol, and firearms, in addition to other legislations in the name of traditions and family values, were carried out under President Park's administration. In the year 2006, the United Korean government reorganized its military and police force in emulation of the American military. Peace doesn't last too long, however, when in 2009, a new terrorist group led by an individual who calls himself Yi Ho Dong, the same name of the former general who was shot down over the Chinese-Korean border, starts attacking Japanese corporate installations. Things weren't too bad as the Korean Peninsula slowly started recovering with major population centers in New Pyongyang, Seoul, Busan, and Incheon continue to expand in a mostly stable economy. An economic boom would occur in the 2010s to the early 2020s as United Korean corporations, what referred to as Korean versions of Zaibatsus but more accurately like Samsung, would be called Chebor in reality, continue to grow. Pre-Korean War megacorporations such as the Sungan Industries, which was the largest megacorp dealing in weapons and vehicle manufacturing alongside their rival the Tanson Group, the second largest Korean megacorp would hold much influence during this formative time period. The Fourth Corporate War would start in the year 2021 with megacorporations such as Militech and Arasaka, banks and governments being pulled into a vortex of violence by the Sino and Otech corporations. This global conflict would keep escalating, leading to a total breakdown of international trade and supply chains in the year 2023. Container ship and air travel have been totally disrupted at this point in time. Supplies and food sit on docks worldwide, unable to reach stores, factories, or suppliers. Many mega corporations collapse completely. And an event many of us are familiar with happens during a fateful evening on the 20th of August 2023, the so-called Night City Holocaust. An incursion team led by Solo Morgan Blackhand and rocker boy Johnny Silverhand breach Arasaka Towers in Night City, and during their assault, a nuclear device is detonated which destroys most of central Night City, ending over 750,000 lives. Atmospheric particles from the nuclear blast in Night City, as well as debris from orbital rock strikes, conventional explosives, and the wartime burning and annihilation of cities and agricultural areas create an eerie red pow over skies worldwide. For nearly two years, the skies are tinged with a bloody red color, which eventually dies down to brilliant red sunrises and sunsets up until the year 2035. This time period, starting in 2023, is called the Time of the Red. And it's during this period that United Korea would split once again due to the effects of the Fourth Corporate War. Elements of former North Korea, emboldened by promises of Arasaka support, would break away from the United Korean government, plunging the northern provinces into chaos with warlords and petty fiefdoms waging war. During this tumultuous war, a deadly bioweapon wiped out the South Korean port city of Busan and its population of 4 million people, forcing the struggling United Korean government to simply quarantine the city. 
a shard we can actually find in Cyberpunk 2077 titled The False Rumors Circling Busan alludes to this horrific event. Conspiracy theorists have recently been roused by news of alleged human activity in the ghost city of Busan. Our younger readers may not recall that the Korean city, formerly 4 million strong, was wiped off the face of the earth during the Fourth Corp War. Unofficial sources out there point the finger at Militech, whose tendencies of tyranny led to the creation and spread of lab drowned deadly virus. Accident, experiment, whatever the truth, the virus proved so ahem, virulent that the United Korean Gov still won't lift a strict quarantine on Pusan all these decades later. So why did all these tabloid junkies and sensation seekers all of a sudden become so interested in the dead city again 50 years later? A solar-based detective unearthed satellite images showing signs of life. Well, technical life, that is, in the form of active machinery. But no real surprise there. After all, Busan was one of the world's most heavily automated metropolises. It was a human virus, not the commuter variety. Many of the robots go out to do their work, their repairs, their trash scooping and sorting. These mystery sat images? Just some computers that never got turned off. That's it. The people of United Korea can sleep easy tonight knowing Busan is a ghost town in the metaphorical sense only. This shard not only talks about the deadly event, but also clues us in at least based on information that we can procure in Cyberpunk Red. While certainly it's not officially been confirmed by authorities what exactly happened with this Militech bioweapon, if it was intentional or not, one could speculate due to the strategy for the war at sea during the Fourth Corporate War was to target specific port cities, including Busan, with engineered bioplagues to induce the effect of trade breakdown that it was indeed intentional. Another clue given to us by this shard is that United Korea exists once again as a formal entity, with its government most likely having regained control of the entire Korean peninsula and stabilizing their position sometime between the year 2046 and 2070. Indeed, by the year 2077, we can still hear Korean being spoken even in Night City, and the news broadcast tells us the following. A dead city livens up the news today. Following the catastrophic use of biological weapons in Busan during the Militech Arasaka conflict of the early 2020s, essentially all forms of life have been wiped clean from the megacity. Millions of people, animals, and plants were eradicated in a matter of minutes, and a similar fate awaits any to this day who strays too close to the southern edge of the Korean peninsula and the waters surrounding it. Though not all in the city lie still, Automated systems powered by local tidal energy continue to operate unsupervised. Netwatch has warned that without proper maintenance, any Busan-based AI could, in time, pose a considerable threat. Arasaka has washed their hands of the issue, placing full blame for the ecological and subsequent technical crisis with Militech, who dropped the bombs. NUSA President Rosalind Myers has declined to comment on the matter. While all of this certainly covers the big picture timeline of United Korea, let's explore the more specific details of what such a country is like in the universe of cyberpunk. The population of United Korea as of the year 2020 was 58.1 million people. Adjusting for the eradication of Busan and a general guess of birth rates and how many people died during the time of Red and the Fourth Corporate War, we could say that the population of United Korea could still be north of 50 million people in 2077. As of then, Seoul reportedly had over 14 million inhabitants, New Pyongyang had about 4 million inhabitants, and Incheon had slightly over 3 million. The rest of the population live in other population centers dotted throughout the peninsula. The society of United Korea is still rooted deeply in Confucianism, a patriarchal system, and ultra-nationalism, at least according to an interview conducted between Miss Sun Unsuk of Songgan Industries and WNS Special Correspondent Thomas Matthews. Many Koreans, at least back in the 2020s, didn't like cybertech primarily due to three reasons. The first being religious, primarily Christianity-based beliefs, the second being a fear of cyberpsychosis, and the last reason being anti-Japanese sentiment as most cyberware was developed by Japanese corporations. The last reason, even in our reality, can be felt due to the violent history between the Japanese and Koreans, such as the 1592 Imjin War, 
the annexation of Korea by the Japanese Empire, and the crimes against humanity that followed. Despite the 8.5 billion euro dollars donated to the reconstruction of post-war United Korea, a survey in 2018 in United Korea revealed that 52% of Koreans think of Japan as the enemy, while 53% of Koreans believe that the Japanese self-defense force is a reincarnation of the Japanese imperial military. The feeling is mutual as the Japanese state that they feel repugnance rather than hatred towards Koreans. All of this and the issues cited further in the Pacific Rim sourcebook, such as treatment of Korean immigrants in Japan or discrimination of Japanese people in Korea, is reflective of our reality where such things have happened. While there is no official caste system in United Korea, the concept of the Yangban, or noble gentry, remains prevalent alongside its strong affinity for clan kinships, where it can influence employment in mega corporations, classism, regionalism, and a hybrid blend of nepotism with kinshipism strongly influenced much of Korean society in its high-level politics. A strong focus on male lineage through family registers or clan records exists in both cyberpunk and in our re own reality, it seems. Apparently, the social status of Korean women remains low as of the year 2020 and potentially in the year 2077, as Korean culture tends to change rather slowly. The custom of arranged marriage and pressure on young women to marry even if they graduate university and want something else still exists as a way of merging family business in United Korea. It has been on the rise, apparently, after the unification of the two Koreas. It should be noted that Sun Unsuk and Sungan Industries is of a more progressive or liberal tendency, rumored to be in bed with Arasaka, whereas her and her corporation's rival, the Tansun Group, is of a more conservative and anti-foreigner tendency. Korean society still practices religion, with traditional shamanism being most popular amongst women due to its ideals, and Christianity and Buddhism being the largest followings. An average United Korean citizen doesn't get to legally use weapons, except for non-lethal self-defense tools like tasers or mace sprayers. Carrying knives, bows, and martial arts weapons aren't illegal, but may arouse suspicion from authorities. Despite the strict weapon laws, one can still find many weapons, both legal and illegal, in local black markets that have stockpiles scavenged from the Korean War. While healthcare is not mentioned, we can safely assume due to the strange hypercapitalism of both cyberpunk's United Korea and our South Korea today as of present time, that healthcare may be provided through private and public systems, resulting in very small co-pays, at least compared to Night City or the new United States of America. Certainly not free like the Neo-Soviet Union, we can assume the quality of healthcare is still at least decent in United Korea, based on other information about aspects in the country such as quality of life and food security being decent. As far as public transportation goes, the Korean road system is still one of the fastest and safest in the world of cyberpunk due to post-war civil engineering taking advantage of new space. Korean subways are also incredibly safe and security has bulked up due to terrorist attacks with each train being guarded by two or more well-armed cops while each subway station has an armed squad on standby at all times. Private use of AVs or aerodyne vehicles is explicitly forbidden in United Korea to prevent potential terrorist attacks. There are a few public taxi companies, and most corporations have their own AVs registered for business usage. While the political system of United Korea seems democratic on the surface, there's definitely some nuances to be explored here. The government of United Korea is dominated by nepotism and collusion in the country's military-industrial complex elite bureaucrats and corporates come out of the military with elite officers being given the highest education so they can rise to the top layers of society. This kinshipism and the customs of government are referred to as neo-yangbanism. The ruling neo-yangban classes, however, are not united. There are two factions with one group trying to prevent the growth of the cyberpunk movement in United Korea, while the other is trying to grow it. The conservatives are sure that cyberware and ending cyberpunk will corrupt Korea and cause a socio-economic collapse. They often press for austerity measures and view foreign goods as being unnecessary. The reformists believe that new ideas from the outside world will instead give United Korea an advantage in many areas to prevent economic or military foreign domination. Ironically, the government established by General Yi, who saw the civilian leadership as a lot of bickering incompetence, has turned into the same thing he usurped. 
under this government that now has to deal with domestic terrorists, the Korean military and police, collectively called the Guardians of Peace and Order, keep public order stable. Military police members can arrest any criminal, including high-ranking politicians and high-ranking generals, except the president, which, as one might well imagine, has been used as a political tool to clear out opposition by the ruling administrations. Most MPs are from the army, which introduces a interesting power dynamic, especially if the president is conservative, as the Korean army is mostly made up of reformists, despite, at least on paper, the MPs only needing to answer directly to the president. MPs restrict corporal cops or mercs in their territories, although the Korean government permits mercs or corpos to use their own security forces in their designated private corporate zones if they pay something called a security tax. Post-2020, the Korean military is suspected to be much stronger than the Japanese military, as they have tons of weapons left over from the Korean War. The Koreans also have a mandatory conscription for all males to serve three years in the military, when an active force of 950,000 full-time troops, 3 million militia members, 1 million in reserves, and 2.5 million students who have to partake in military training once a week. While the United Korean military has been developing equipment internally since 2010, most of their hardware is still Militech, Sternmeyer, and Boys in Black derived. In terms of chain of command, the Korean military answers to the Joint Chiefs made up of the top brass of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, who in turn report directly to the Korean president as the Supreme Commander. The Korean Army possesses 2,000 tanks, 1,500 armored personnel carriers, 500 hovers, 500 ACPAs, 500 helicopters, 200 AVs, and 100 ground attack planes. A third of these vehicles are refurbished versions of older models, while all attack planes are reformed F-16s or A-10s. Officers wear field armor, the grunts were Kevlar in the army, while local militia members use pre-Korean War gear like M-16s and AK-47s. Cyberware usage is extremely low even in the military as most Korean soldiers won't accept cyberware, while some reformist officers do use a little bit as a badge of their beliefs. The Korean Navy has six fleets and three marine divisions staffed by 100,000 marines. Each of the six fleets is led by an admiral, while each of the three marine divisions is led by a general. Funnily enough, in terms of politics, the Navy is mostly neutral while the Korean Army is made up of mostly reformists and the Korean Air Force is dominated by the conservatives. The United Korean Navy is equipped with 31 destroyers, 64 frigates, 12 transports, 8 missile cruisers, 6 submarines, 40 helicopters, and 10 AVs. Marine divisions are equipped with 20 patrol ships, 60 hovers, 24 AVs, 100 helicopters, 300 APCs, and 50 ACPAs. Lastly, the United Korean Air Force has at least 10 air divisions, numbering 80,000 personnel, equipped with 600 jet interceptors, 330 ground attack bombers, 70 transport planes, and 60 AVs. Of course, we can't be remiss in not talking about the Korean economy, or more specifically, the United Korean megacorporations. The two main Korean megacorporations are Sungan Industries and Tanson Group. Headquartered in Seoul, with regional offices in six other cities, including Night City, Songun Industries boasts an impressive 400,000 employee count with a focus on cyberware and weapons manufacturing and distribution. Songun Industries supported General Yi before he commenced the coup d'etat, and while it's almost tradition for supporters of past regimes to fall out of favor or be targeted by the new regime, Songun Industries was too big to fall to mere political pressure. Their corporation has connections in Europe, North America, and Japan. It is still presumably led by Son eun suk the only female corporate head in Korea as of 2020. Her company's business techniques and advertisements are provocative and considered radical as they promote the cyberpunk movement while critiquing Korean culture, as you may have guessed from her interview covered earlier in the video. On the other hand, the Tanson Group, which also manufactures and distributes weapons, vehicles, and all kinds of electronics that are not cyberware, is headquartered in the city of Gwangju in United Korea with three regional offices, only one of them being outside of Korea in Los Angeles. The major stockholder and de facto leader of Tanson Group is or was Chan chung Il, who was 95 years old as of the year 2020. If he's still alive as of 2077, he'd be 152 years old, which would be 6 years younger than the 158-year-old Saburo Arasaka. 
The Tansun Group is characterized by hostile takeovers and targeting of foreign companies. Chun Chung Il and more than likely other members of the Megacorp are convinced that United Korea is being corrupted by both foreign influences and their rivals at Sungan Industries. Of note is his particular hatred of Saburo Arasaka, whose mere name being mentioned in Chung Chung Il's presence results in a room being smashed up and destroyed. This may be due to a rumor that the Chun family were formerly mere servants on the Arasaka estates in Korea during the Japanese occupation before and during the Second World War. It's really fascinating, particularly as a Korean, to see how my homeland may be doing in the universe of cyberpunk. The cultural themes and other characteristics of Korean society, for the most part, were on point, and I thoroughly enjoyed delving into the lore. Thank you so much for watching, and let me know down in the comments below what subject in Cyberpunk you'd like to hear more lore about, maybe your country or another region you're curious about. If you like game lore, definitely check out my previous videos on Starfield, Armor Core 6, and Assassin's Creed, or subscribe to the channel to keep up to date on more Cyberpunk lore. Until next time, Chooms, stay Nova.